Hello and welcome to Village Church. I'm here today with Finu. Finu is our regional director in Ontario. And I have a personal admiration for Finu, just getting to know him and his family and his love for Jesus. And I'm just so excited for what God is going to do through you guys. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Well, uh, Kristen, it's just been a couple of months now that we've been on the team here at Village Church. Absolutely thrilled for the opportunity to plan churches in the greater Toronto area and then eventually right across Ontario. And you know what's really cool is already we've got over 100 people that have signed up and said, I'm interested in being a part of a Village Church site in the greater Toronto area. And we've got community groups going already, about six of them right now, all happening online. So it's an amazing opportunity to make an impact in really the largest city in our nation. Seven million people uh, live in the greater Toronto area. And here's the cool part, 100,000 people come into Toronto uh, every single year. So when we talk about reaching people that are far from Jesus and seeing them transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus, uh, there's no better place to plant churches than in the city of Toronto. So we're so pumped to be able to do it. And talking about that, Kristen, uh, we're actually doing a new series starting on February 28th. It's a five-part series, and it's all about how we reach people and share the gospel uh, with skeptics. So tell us more. Okay, so our very own Pastor Mark Clark, his book, Problem of Jesus, is coming out in just over a week. So you can pre-order your copy today, wherever you order books online. Um, and he is diving in just into the question skeptics are asking and challenging the Christian on the life and the message and the mission of Jesus. So we have a privilege as a church to go through a five-week series with our very own Pastor Mark Clark, and that starts February 28th. And so let's check out this preview here. So I didn't grow up with Jesus in my life at all, but once I was presented with him, I explored him. And I wanted to know whether like, was his life legitimate from a historical vantage point? What was he on about? Were the gospels, the stories that told his life actually legitimate, things I could trust? Were the miracles things that were actually real? Like I'm a modern type thinking person and I'm kind of a skeptic about a lot of this stuff. And, and what about his main message about loving God and discipleship and his death and his miracles and what he said about being God and exclusively just following him? You know, all this stuff about Jesus kind of drove me crazy. So I started exploring it. And I realized that uh, Jesus was not only a real historical figure, but he had a message to the people who existed around him and to me. And it changed everything that I did with my life. And it can do the same with you. So this is what the problem of Jesus explores. It's the question of, did the person of Jesus really exist? A hugely debated topic today. And who is Jesus? For you, for me, he changes everything. But was he who he said he was? Can we trust the very things that he talked about? His life, his ministry, his stories, his death, his resurrection, they are kind of the thing that defines the fate of everyone who's ever lived. And that's not an overstatement. This series is all about why that's true. Man, that was such an amazing video presentation talking about the impact that this series is going to make in the lives of thousands of people right across Canada and around the world. So great opportunity to invite friends and family to check out this series that starts on February the 28th. I am personally so excited. And with that, I'd love to pray as we move into the rest of the service. Father, we just come today with grateful hearts, just thankful that we have this ability to, to meet together online as a church. And we are united as in one mind and in one thought, diving into this book of John. And I thank you that no matter how we're engaging, if we're watching on our couch or in our kitchen, wherever we're at, you are present with us. And with this posture, would we just move into a place of praise and adoration, amen.
ourselves as he sees us, full of compassion and full of grace. May we choose to move forward in hope. And as we do, we ask God to circle us in his love. So we sing hallelujah. We lift his name. Village Church, Pastor Mark here. Glad you are among us. Grab your Bibles. We're going to jump right into this. John chapter 2. We're exploring probably one of the most famous stories in the Gospels, one of the most famous stories ever about Jesus turning water into wine. Last week was part one. Today is part two, where we talk about the meaning of this thing. And let me start off uh, by some of you who've been to our church before have heard me tell this story or, or been part of our church for a while. But let me just kind of bring you into the end of the story. Uh, one day, years ago, I'm sitting in my office and a colleague of mine walks into my office, middle of the day, and just says, hey man, I was praying in my office and the Holy Spirit told me that you're supposed to go and visit this uh, lady that goes to our church. And I'm like, why would I do that? Just randomly walk, I've never walked up to someone's door randomly in our church and just knocked and gone, hey, wanna hang out? And he's like, the Holy Spirit, and I was like, yeah, I'm kind of sensitive that like, this is crazy. And he's, I'm like, they'll do it tomorrow. He's like, no, it's gotta be today. It's gotta be now. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, I don't know, man. I'm just, so I, get in my car and I go to her house and I ring the doorbell and I wait and she doesn't come to the door. Now, usually I'm like, hey, I'm out. But I sit there for 15 minutes because I just sense like I got to. And so she finally comes to the door. Is your PJs in the afternoon? She's like, you know, yes, what would you like? And I'm like, I don't know. I just felt the sense I need to come here. And I go in, I have tea with her and she basically looks at me and says after about two and a half hours together, do you know why I'm sitting in my PJs at two o'clock in the afternoon? I said, no. And she said, because I came down the stairs today and I was so depressed and I was so overwhelmed. I went to the kitchen and I said, Lord, I'm gonna take my own life today. And she said, I, I fell asleep on the chair, praying to God saying, if you're not wanting me to take my own life today, send someone to my door that's gonna knock on my door and encourage me today because that will be a sign. And I fell asleep and woke up to you two hours later ringing my doorbell. How do you explain stuff like that? How do you, I mean, this is where, if you're a naturalist, if you're someone who doesn't believe in God, these are the kinds of stories you can't just write off. You actually, if you're an evidential thinker, have to think and deal with evidence rather than I don't want something to be true. So I de facto already start out with a presupposition. These things can always be explained by natural causes. You see, out of the millions of explanations of things that have occurred that seem to be supernatural in the world, it only takes kind of one of those stories to have any kind of credibility for the whole paradigm of naturalism to fall apart. The whole paradigm of atheism falls apart if one miracle story is actually true throughout history. And this is the kind of thing that this story raises and puts in front of our face. Maybe the world is more complex than we think. Maybe there's a fusion. We tend to think like God and Jesus and the Bible, they are things that deal with, you know, salvation and heaven and hell and God and spirituality. And that's kind of one part of our life. And then, you know, the world of politics and sex and money and family life and marriage, that work, those are over here and never the two shall meet. And 
we see in the person and the work of Jesus, both of those worlds coming together and realizing they're just, they're just opposite ends of the same coin. They're, they're, they're connected in such a beautiful way and they all connect and come together in the person and the work of Jesus, which is what the Gospel of John is presenting to us. And now we come to one of the most famous stories, the story of water and wine. And last week we hit part one where he's sitting with his friends. His mother comes, said they've run out of wine. Jesus says, I'm gonna do something about it. And then she goes to the servants and says, okay, we're out of wine do whatever he tells you, right? And remember we talked about he's sitting there with his boys, the toothpick. And now here we go. Uh, it says this. Here's John's commentary now in verse six. Now there were six, this is gonna be important. There were six stone water jars, right? And so uh, he says, there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about what all this means in a second, but let's just get the story in front of us. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some of it out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, meaning uh, if you're going to serve some bad wine, wait till everyone's kind of a little, you know, had a couple and then, you know, go from the bottles to the boxes, basically is what he's saying. Bring out the box of wine later. Let's serve the good stuff first. But you have kept the good wine until now. We're going to realize that is the, probably the theological statement of this whole thing. And then he says this, the first of his signs. Now this is important. Jesus did at Canaan and Galilee. So John hones us in and says, this miracle, this sign is the first one he did. Now, let's just talk about this, this concept of signs for a second. So have you ever seen the movie Signs, M. Night Shyamalan? So, you know, aliens come and everyone thinks the movie's about aliens. But then when you watch the movie, you get to the end of the movie and the credits roll and you realize that the word signs is being used in a different way than you thought. It's not actually, it's not really a movie about aliens. It's a movie about the concept of the supernatural. It's a movie saying, do you actually believe there's somebody behind the veil? Because of course the story is about this ex-priest who believed in God until he had suffering in his life. And then he said, there's too much suffering and evil in the world. And then are you gonna track the signs down to believe that the world actually functions like this? And so the question of the movie is, yes, there's a supernatural world and there's signs that point us this and they're all over in life. They're, they're little things like, why does his daughter want so many glasses of water constantly around? Why is there a baseball bat? And so you got to go watch the movie. But the point is, they're pointing toward the supernatural. So this is the way John is using the concept of signs. He's saying, of course, we got to go, and look at this, the first of his signs. So if we're good readers of story, we're going to check that in our brain and go, okay, he's counting for us now? He's going to count how many signs. And so what scholars do is they talk about the idea that chapter 1 to 11 in the Gospel of John is called the book of signs. It's where John starts to tell us, hey, here's the first sign. And then later in chapter 4, there's going to be a healing and he stops and he talks to us again, the audience. It's kind of like, you know, those movies where it's going along and then the guy turns like, okay, here's what's happening now. John constantly turns to the audience to say, this is the second sign. In chapter four, he tells us. And then we're kind of left on our own to count. And this is from chapter one to chapter 11 is called the book of signs. There are things miracles, things that happen that are pointing to something. And so you have, um, you have water and a wine here, which of course echoes the, the Exodus story where God turned the water of the Nile into blood. And you have this kind of I'm a new Moses image. And then you have the official son in chapter four. That's the second sign. And then you have a, a man by a pool in chapter five who gets healed. You have the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter six. You have walking on water in chapter six, a man born blind that gets healed in chapter nine and the raising of Lazarus in chapter 11. And then all the signs stop. And there's seven, which is this great symbolic number to uh, Jews about the number of completeness, which is interesting when we get to the, the number of stone water jars that were at the wedding because there's six, which represents not completeness yet, which I'll get to in a second. So you have seven signs and then you have none until the ultimate sign, which is the resurrection. The cross and the resurrection become the sign of the, the new creation, the, the, the kind of eight thing that happens to dawn a new world. Okay, so this is all the imagery that we're looking for, but you have this image of signs, pointers 
to something about God, but then something about ourselves, something about the world, something about, it's signs for all of these things. And so what we, we're gonna do a, a, a series called The Problem of Jesus, coincides with uh, the coming out of my book in February through March as a church leading into Easter. And we're gonna do an entire week on miracles. So I'm not gonna get into all of the science, but invite your friends to that because it'll be a great moment to talk about are miracles a thing that is respected from a scientific and a philosophical ver- uh, vantage point versus just theology and the Bible and Christians believing in things that don't actually, and we're gonna realize, man, we're gonna do a deep dive into miracles. But the one thing I'll say about it is just this for now. Recognize that Christians don't look at signs, these miracles as just some random thing that happens in nature if you give it enough time. It's not an alien, you know, uh, an alien outside coming in and doing something. What we realize is you always have to posit God into the equation. This is why the New Testament says God raised Jesus from the dead. It's not like nature just spit him back out because it happened to be a good time or whatever. So it's actually harder. You got to, if you're going to disbelieve in a miracle like the raising from the dead or the water and the wine, you've got to actually disprove the, the, the probability of the existence of God, which is a much harder thing to do from a philosophical, psychological, historical, you know, scientific um, uh, vantage point. So what we understand is when a miracle happens, it's not an alien from the outside doing something. God is the one who's part of his creation. And when, you, when, when a law of nature gets uh, violated, as some people would look at it, like David Hume and the philosophers, that are, miracles can't happen because it's a violation of the laws of nature. Uh, it's not though. If I um, take the law of gravity, for instance, if I dropped an apple, or an apple fell from a tree, and I caught it. Did I violate the laws of gravity? No, I interrupted them. That's what a miracle is. It's an interruption on a micro level that then gets a macro application. But here's the beautiful, and I love this about miracles. They don't just hover in kind of a random space. They become part of the fabric of creation and the story that they're a part of. So let me give you an example of this. Um, One writer, uh, C.S. Lewis, talks about it this way. He says, uh, miracles start to obey the rules of the world. And so when he's talking about this miracle of water into wine, which is such a beautiful miracle, isn't it? Like one writer has described it this way. The water saw its master and blushed. That's what's going on in this miracle. But but Lewis says this, um, miraculous wine, will intoxicate. Miraculous conception will lead to pregnancy. Miraculous bread will be digested. The divine art of miracle is not an art of suspending the pattern to which events conform, but of feeding new events into that pattern. And then he says this about this. I love this. He says, God creates the vine and teaches it to draw up water by its roots, and with the aid of the sun to turn that water into a juice, which will ferment and take on certain qualities. Thus, every year from Noah's time until ours, God turns water into wine. And here Jesus does it in a, in a moment. That's the, it's a speeding up of a natural process. What's raising from death? It's a reversal of a natural movement of entropy. And so the point is, is this, and this is the beautiful thing about miracles, is the only beautiful, uh, actual thing in an unnatural world, as Jürgen Moltmann says. It's a restoring. It's a, it's, a, it's a weed cracking up through the concrete of the decaying, demonic-filled, evil world. That we, and this is the birth of the real new creation. It's wine time. Let's take the water, the stale water. And this is the second meaning I want to talk about, what it means for the world. Let's take the stale water of history. Let's take the stale water of of life and the way that people have tried to connect to God and let's let's bring it to to its new phase. That's the big image. And let me explain how that works. Look at what it says. It says, Now, there were six stone water jars, and what were they there for? John tells us, as Gentile readers, it's actually super helpful. John's gospel is actually written to a lot, you know, most of us probably aren't Jews who are reading this, and so he explains stuff, and he says, what's it for? It's for the Jewish rites of purification, the Jewish rites 
of purification. Now that's going to be crucial because what he's saying is, what did Jesus come to do? Did he come, the, the sign is trying to tell us what Jesus came to do. What did Jesus come to do? To be a winemaker? No. The hint is here. These six stone jars were at a wedding and here's what they were used for. We would go to a wedding and remember we were there. We'd be there for six or seven days. And so we'd be all hanging out and we'd go to sleep and we'd go to food and our hands would get dirty. And so we would go to these. Now, I was in Cana years ago. I went to, to Israel and one day we'll probably go there and I'll bring you know a bunch of you from Village Church who want to go. And, um, and the stone water jars were in Cana. They come up to about here and they're about that round and you would use them to, pu- to wash your hands to purify you from a ritual standpoint because the Old Testament had said, if you touch this, you gotta wash. And then if you do this, you gotta wash, you gotta wash. So you have the, the, the Jewish rites of purification represented in these six stone water jars, okay? So John tells us that, remember everything John says has a meaning behind it. And what is he trying to say? He tells us there are six. To a Jew, six was always a very important number. Six was one less than the number of perfection, as I talked about, six days of creation, and then Sabbath. And what he's trying to say, here's what William Barclay says, who's a New Testament scholar. He says, the water pot stand for all the imperfections of the Jewish law. They came up just short. Jesus came to do away with the imperfections of the law and to put in their place the new wine of the gospel of his grace. Jesus turns the imperfection of religion into the perfection of grace. This is the meaning behind what he's doing. John, this isn't a throwaway line. This is maybe the quintessential theological point of the whole passage. Jesus has come to say there is a new era dawning in the world, and here's what it means. Everything represented by religion has now reached its point of climax and I'm here to shut it down. And religion and ritual is giving way to relationship. God has entered the world and he's turning this old way of connecting to him, the water represented in ritual and, 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 and extended out there to, to religion itself. And I'm now superseding it. I'm bringing it to its intended point. And now it needs to be retired. This is, this is a summary of what John has told us in John chapter 1. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Remember, it took us a few weeks to get through this text. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law had its moment, but now it's giving way to something else. Jesus is the new wine. And all of that is coming to an end. Um, Paul in Philippians 3 talks about the idea that I used to try to do all these things and it felt really good to be involved in religion. Because it does, right? Those of you who might you, might, you might be watching this and you belong to another religion. We're glad you're watching this. Jesus has, and John has this message. Religion's over. The te- temple sacrifices, whatever religion you, you, uh, you, you belong to, if you do sacrifices in a sacred temple, and there's sacred space that you has set aside where the gods dwell. It's over. If there's rituals where you have to, have to sacrifice animals or grain, or it's over. If there's holy land that you're fighting for, thinking this land is more holy than that land, and we need to make sure it's over. It's all over. It's all gone. Jesus shows up and he says, there's... there's there's, we can't climb a mountain to God. So I've come down the mountain to do this for you, to bring in the, 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 the sweet color of vibrant, true relationship and life. The, the law, in a sense, it is, it, is, it is given birth to this new way of connecting with the God of the universe. And so are you willing to walk away from the old stone water pots of religion and give your life to the one who gives you new wine or not. 
even Christians are offended at times by this because we haven't really grasped the concept that Jesus might have been doing more in his life and ministry than we give credit. Think about the next story, the one we'll hit next week. He kind of does this same thing, but he does it to the ultimate religious symbol, the temple itself. The very next story is him basically doing the same thing with the temple. And he goes in and he says, this thing's over because I, it's actually the temple of my body that matters now. And there's this, you know, you have people who are like, well, doesn't Holy Land matter anymore? Doesn't temples matter anymore? And I was reading one scholar, N.T. Wright, points out, he says, if we think that way, if we think that stuff actually matters, he says, it's a way of saying that in the cross and resurrection, God did not actually fulfill his whole saving purpose. That Jesus did not, in fact, achieve the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. That his resurrection was not the start of God's new age. That Acts is wrong. Romans is wrong. Galatians is wrong. The letter to the Hebrews is wrong. The book of Revelation is wrong. And then he says this, say that if you like, but don't claim to be Christian in doing so. See, sometimes, guys, we think Jesus came and did a nice, cute, religious thing and we all move on and make it part of our personal life in my heart. It's me. He's doing a crazy, cosmic, offensive thing here to the world. It's offensive to everybody. It's, and here's how I know. When I took that trip to Cana and Galilee years ago, our guide was this awesome Jewish man named Abraham. And he took us all around. I built a relationship with Abraham for the whole week I was there. And we got to Cana. And the guy I was with said, hey, here's what I want you to do. We're standing in front of these water pots. I'd like, Mark, why don't you share a Devo? So I get up to share a Devo. But what am I going to share about? Jesus is the nice wine for your life. He's, good, you know, yeah, nice. But I'm seeing in the text this like massively like, there's implication for the cosmos here. There's this is, this is a new epoch in salvation history that is dawning on the world. This is the first sign that God is, I mean, I've seen all this crazy stuff. And so I say, as I'm standing in front of these pots and there's, you know, probably a hundred people around me and I'm, I get to do this Devo and Abraham and, I'm, and I tell them what I just told you about Jesus has brought this to a climax and religion has given way to relationship. I've come to shut down religion. I'm giving all of this. And later on, we got in the car and Abraham looked at me. He's like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Do you actually think that's what that story means? And I said, yeah, bro. Like, Jesus was the, he's the Messiah. He fulfills Israel's story. He fulfills what these stones, draw. It's, it's law giving way to grace. As, as, as phases, as eras in salvation history. And now we can't go back because that would be like going back. Um, I, I, I've told you this um, story before about um, uh, UC Baby and how, you know, we went and got a DVD and watched the little ultrasound, but how weird it would be that once I had my baby, if I went back and sat and looked at that ultrasound and just watched that all the time, but my, the real thing has arrived, so don't go back. The other image I would give is like a rocket ship goes up, you know, and, and they have this, the, the, the boosters on the side. And then once it gets out of the atmosphere, those boosters come off because they serve their purpose. And to, um, it's destructive to go back and try to put those on. You know, you actually blow the ship up. And so they've reached this point and they've done their job. And this is Paul's entire argument in Galatians 3 and 4. The law was a, a pedagogue. It was a, a tutor, a teacher, but you don't bring the teacher along. Like if you have a tutor that brings you up through school and walks you to, to elementary school, they tend to be gone by the time you're at college. Like they're not walking with you, making your lunch when you get to college. These are the images of salvation history. And Jesus and, and Abraham said, do you really think? And I said, yeah. And he said, let me tell you something. I've been doing this job for 20 years. He said, I've brought probably three, four hundred Christian groups to this spot and heard devotions every time. And never once have I heard someone say what you just said. I got to think this through. That's how we know this was like a grenade in that culture. This was not a cute little time of, hey, everyone, Jesus is here. He's a nice guy. This was 
Now, think about how this flows down to our life then. And we've, we talk about this often as a church about how you know, religion has given way. But think about this in relationship to your life, uh, even if you're a Christian, because there's Christian versions of this. I was reading something the other day um, from one writer, and he, and he compares how this filters down to your and I life when it's religion versus the gospel. He says, in religion, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. Right? That's how many of us still live, even if we're Christians. But the gospel says, I'm accepted, therefore I obey. Religion says, my motivation in life is based on fear and insecurity. God is going to get me. Bad things are going to happen to me, so I better do this. In the gospel, our motivation is based on grateful joy of what Jesus Christ has done, and then we live from that place. In religion, I obey God in order to get things from God. You've heard this preached. If you do these things, God will bless you with wealth and health and security and prosperity and life. And, and, but if you don't, in the gospel, I obey God to get God, to delight and resemble him. In religion, in the old stone water jars version of ourselves, when circumstances in my life go wrong, I'm angry at God or myself since I believe, like Job's friends, that anyone who is good deserves a comfortable life. That's the construct of religious thinking. Even if you're not formally religious, if you're sitting there going, oh, I don't look good thing. I don't belong to a formal religion. No, you do. Even if you're an atheist, you think you deserve a comfortable life that the universe owes it to you because you're a good person. I've asked many, many people who don't have anything to do with God. Why, why do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? Because I'm a good person, because I'm not Hitler. And if because I'm not Hitler, I deserve a comfortable life. In the recesses of your brain, that's what we think. It's religion. The gospel says, when circumstances in my life go wrong, I struggle, but I know that while God may allow this for my training, he will exercise his fatherly love within my trial. In religion, when I'm criticized, think about it. You've been criticized lately? I'm furious or I'm devastated. I mean, I just look at my social media page. <laughs> I'm going I'm to be devastated or furious and angry and go in a corner and twist my hair and be like, Nee! Because it is essential for me to think of myself as a good person, right? So when someone offends you or says you did cr- criticize you, you're like, I, you freak out because you have to be a good person. Threats to that self-image must be destroyed at all costs. In the gospel, when I'm criticized, I struggle, but it's not essential for me to think of myself as a good person. My identity is not built on my performance, but on God's love for me in Christ. In religion, my prayer life consists of petition and only heats up when I am in need. My main purpose in prayer is to control circumstances. Do you feel yourself doing that? See, these are impulses, our religious impulses. In the gospel, my prayer life consists of generous stretches of praise and adoration for who God is, and my main purpose in praying is fellowship with him. See, that's the difference. And Jesus Christ has come to give this new way of being human. This is how beautiful it is. So you have this thing that it's saying to the world. That's what this story means for the world. But let's, let's, let's pivot now and spend the rest of our time on this question. Uh, what does it mean for you personally? I think the hint is in, uh, in verse 10. They're each holding 20 or 30 gallons, which means, by the way, that's a lot of juice right there. 20 or 30 gallons of wine equals, so when he takes, he gets these filled up to the brim, right? Filled up to the brim, so the text says, because... He doesn't want anyone to think someone dabbed in some, you know, red sauce in there when he makes the wine. But Barclay points out this great little point. He says, once he changes the water into wine, there is no more water left. Like, you can't go back and do religion at that party. 
He ha- he's, he's made it so that there's no remainder. There's no way to go back to the religion and the, pur- the old purification laws because he's changed it all. It's like an invitation. And he changes 20 or 30 gallons times six. Guys, this is 900 bottles of wine. <laughs> now, it's, it's definitely lower on the alcohol scale than the stuff we drink. We're drinking 13 you know, percent. It wouldn't have been that high, right? So he's not, he's not, this isn't the finest. I mean, it would, taste, it would be the finest wine anyone's ever tasted. I mean, I, you know, I almost offended Jesus by saying he couldn't make great wine. I mean, he's, this is the best wine you ever tasted, but like it's down on the alcohol scale. But he makes 900 bottles. And, and, and com- commentators don't really know what to do with that because there's no way this party's getting through that much. And, and I think there's this great little, you know, like the abundance of grace. It's like you get more than you need. When you take Jesus, you get more grace than you need. You get more power than you need. You get more forgiveness. And I mean, you get the perfect amount of forgiveness that you need, but it's stuff that you would never, you would think, This has to end somewhere. There's no way Jesus forgives me for this sin because I've been doing it so long. There's no way he's going to forgive me for this habit. There's no way he's going to forgive me for this mistake. I've fumbled it again. There's no possible way. There's enough grace for this. And this party goes, oh yeah, no, no, no. This party probably needed 40 bottles. Let me give you 900. So it takes you right to the end of your life and beyond, man. This is the God that we serve in the person of Jesus. Verse seven, said to the servants, fill the jars with water so that there's no remainder left. But look at verse, look at verse 10. When the master, uh, verse nine, when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, did not know where it came from, though the servants knew the feast, of the, uh, the master of the feast called the bride and said, everyone serves the good wine first. But when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. You know what I think that is? I think that's a little commentary on the, on the theology of what I just told you. I think he's saying the first phase of religious history was good. Like law was good. Moses gave us something beautiful to connect. To. I get I, Beautiful, beautiful. But you've kept the good wine until now. This is better. Like, Grace is better than law. The phase of salvation history that this is in this moment, is, is, it's better. And so what do we see? We see a transformation. Think about your own life. Like, what is this a sign about? It's a sign of not just the meta, it's the micro, it's the transformation. He's not just doing a magic trick. You know, my, my uh, second daughter, Hayden, loves magic. She's all into, she does all these magic shows. She does this crazy. She did a magic show the other day. We're sitting, I actually don't know how she did it. We're sitting, having dinner, and she goes, I want you to choose a number between blah, blah, blah. So we're like, oh, one of these ones. So we chose a number, and then she's like, okay, I want you to choose this, this number. Choose that. She's like, okay, so this, take away that. She's like, hey, uh, you know, Aaron, your number, take away Mark's number. Yep. Okay. And then she goes like this, not a joke. She goes, okay, mom, um, check your pocket. My wife's like, what is it, David Copperfield? So she pulls out an envelope, a sealed envelope. She doesn't even know how it got in her pocket. This is not, and she opens a sealed envelope and it's the number. It's the number Aaron threw out minus the number I threw out is in my wife's pocket and she didn't know I was like, what's going on? Okay, so that's a magic trick. That is not what Jesus is doing. This isn't magic unto magic. This isn't, look at me, I'm divine. Remember, it's a sign. It's that, but it's something else. It's about, I transformed on a, on a salvation history level this, but this is now about you. See, when we start our church, like, uh, 11 years ago, we, we came up with this mission statement and we could have had a lot of mission statements, but the mission statement we came up with is to see people transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus. You know why? Because of a story like this. This is about transformation. This is about, as, as, as uh, one of the verses talks about, um, you see the, the, this line here, purification. See that word, purification? This is This is... The work that we're talking about is not just great in the law court of God, you're saved now. It's the purifying of your life. 
I want to see you not just believe some Bible stuff. And the 16 people that got together, we said to ourselves, yeah, we could be the church that just teaches the Bible as a thing and that's it. But I want to teach the Bible unto purification. I want to teach the Bible unto transformation of your life. I, and this is what the gospel offers you and Christianity offers you. It doesn't offer you just new doctrine, guys. It offers you transformation of your life that your marriage can, can be better on the other side of Jesus. That the way you deal with money can be better on the other side. The way you raise your teenagers, the way you interact with people, your, your dark heart, you know. I read this Spurgeon thing the other day. He said, you know, uh, if people don't like you, if people think you're a bad person, don't disagree with them because you're actually worse than they think you are. You know that in the dark, how manipulative. Like, you see, all the things about your life, I got into this to see transformation. I, I, when, I, when I work with couples around their marriage, I don't want to just know information. I want to see transformation in their life. I want to see that abuse stop. Shepherding people through abuse scenarios during this COVID time seeing repentance, seeing families actually healed, guys, seeing people freed from the depression of isolation, seeing people have hope again. This is the stuff of purification. He said, I want you to be better on the other. I want you to have more hope. I want you to be alive. He's going to say, truly human life. This is about dealing with your anger problems. This story. This is about your guilt and your shame. This is about your materialism. This is about your addiction. This is about the bland ruins of your tasteless lives giving way to a life that is sweet again, like wine. This is the vision Jesus Christ has for every single one of you watching this. And the more you deny it and run from it, the more you just stave off the purification, the transformation of your life. We look at purification as a bad thing. No, no, he's saying, you know how to be happy? You know, you go to the Beatitudes. Matthew 5 starts off, you know, blessed are the meek for they will do the, blessed are those who, you know, blessed is the, the word happy, makairoi in, in, in the Greek. It's, he's saying, and, and then he says, blessed are the ones who, who hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness. You know what he, he's saying? You know how to get happiness in your life? It's not by chasing after happiness. It's by chasing after righteousness. It's by going, hungering and thirsting to be pure. And that's what's gonna give way to your joy. In the short run and in the long run, the problem is we don't believe it. We wanna do the quick trade and go, ah, but if I just sleep with them, then it's gonna feel good. And that's what I want. I want the short-term gain. If I just buy that dress, it's going to make me feel good. If I just do get angry again, it's going to make me feel good. Short-term, short-term, short-term gain. And over time, as you let Jesus work on you, that's the practical micro stuff that's going to change and be purified in you so that God changes what you do through changing what you want to do. He's going to purify. Think of the images of water. What is water about? purification. Do you know how many times John uses the concept of water through this gospel? I wrote them down all the way through it. Water baptism in chapter one. Chapter two, water and the wine. Chapter three, Nicodemus must be born from water and the spirit. In chapter four, Jesus offers the Samaritan woman water at the well. Chapter five, there's a miracle next to a pool. Chapter six, Jesus walks on water. Chapter seven, Jesus relates the living water to the Holy Spirit. In chapter nine, the man born blind must go and wash in the pool of Siloam. In chapter 13, Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. In chapter 19, Jesus is pierced and water and blood come out. This is like a major theme of John. He wants you purified as if through water. Isn't that like, it's beautiful. He wants your marriage to be better. He wants your work life to be better. He wants your heart to be better. He doesn't want you falling into temptation anymore, but he's, the, he's not gonna grind you down for it. He's gonna purify you so that it doesn't affect you the way it was. This is why if you read a, 
There's a book that came out a bunch of years ago called The Experience Economy, and it's talking about how we as a people want to experience stuff. We don't just want to buy goods and services. We want to experience stuff. And then at the end of that book, two Harvard professors say, the next phase is the transformation economy. We are a people that not only wants to experience something, we want that experience of that thing to transform our very lives. If you are a skeptic watching this, I know that your question is not just, is Christianity true? Your question is, does it work? Does it work to solve my loneliness? Does it work to change my guilt to victory? Does it, does it shift me? Does it change anything about the way I look at my spouse and my, the way I'm a failed father or a failed young adult or whatever? Yes, yes, yes all because of grace, all because of the purifying, what's, what the New Testament called sanctifying work of Jesus. But that is, that is a work that is humbling in a sense because you have to, I have a friend who's trying to experience transformation in his life right now. And he, he went to a uh, kind of a rehab center, I guess you could call it, um, in the States called Onsite. And it's this beautiful s space where you, you have to face yourself in the end. You have to spend time being healed and facing yourself. I mean, that's a, that's a humble journey. The shifting of, of moving in your personal life from water to wine, it sounds beautiful, but think about how wine's made, right? I, I mean, Grapes get crushed. And sometimes to be changed, it feels like surgery. I had two friends a few years ago look at me and, and call me out, you know, over lunch. They said, hey, there's a thing about you we don't like. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, well, there's four things about you I don't like, so get the bill. You know, I'm out. Uh, no, but it was really good because... You know, it wasn't some big moral thing. It was just this thing, and, and, but it was good to hear it because it was like, it was hard to hear it. It was humbling, and it, it kind of felt like a cut, but it made me better. And sometimes the purifying work of God in our life crushes and hurts, and it's painful, but ultimately it makes us better. That's what surgery does. It takes a bit to heal from it but it makes you better. And it, that's the whole point of this story. You kept the better wine till now. This is a better way. This is truly human life. This is happiness. This is color. This is, this is joy. This is the dull, flat, stale version of my life becoming sparkling and colorful and taste-filled again. Like, this is what this can be for you. You know, uh, again, Spurgeon, they call him the Prince of Preachers. And he used to teach preachers how to preach. Um, and he gave them this image. I, I was reading him recently, you know, and I love this because, of course, all this takes place at a wedding, right? And so, you know, Spurgeon points out, like, Jesus isn't a killjoy. He's at a wedding. He's celebrating. He's having fun. Jesus isn't the, Ray, make sure you have no fun in your life. Drag yourself around and be miserable. And here's what Spurgeon said. I love it. He goes, he's talking to preachers, teaching preachers how to preach. And he said, monotones and seriousness may fit a person to be an undertaker, but Lazarus was not called out of his grave by hollow moans. I commend to you cheerfulness, to all who would win souls, not levity and frothiness, but a happy spirit. More souls will be led to heaven by a person who wears heaven in their face than by one who bears hell in his looks. <laughs> That's why he's a prince of preachers. Boom, mic drop. Your transformation and joy and happiness that comes about through knowing Jesus is your best evangelistic tool to draw people to the one who's giving you that happiness and joy. Now, let me end this way. How does all this actually happen? 
Is it by reading the right books? Is it by, you know, getting on the Peloton? Is it by, you know, whatever? No, it, it happens because of part of the text we looked at last week with, you know, the hour, my hour. And we talked about how the hour was the cross. And what the cross accomplishes is it takes the wrath of God for you. It, it's this sacrifice that forgives your sins so that sacrifices aren't needed anymore. That's why the sacrificial system can be over because Jesus Christ dies on a cross in your place as your substitute, putting an end to all sacrifice. No, no sacrifice is ever needed again because he says it is finished. That's his declaration from the cross. It is finished. Um, but can I, but it is say the purification and transformation of your life happens by way of the cross. That's the center of this whole story. That's what verse four was about. But let me just say this. Um, it's also what the, what the cross creates. The New Testament has this great image that what the cross creates is a, we are in Christ. It's not just we're you know, justified, it's you're in Christ. There's a righteousness. Corinthians talks about this. Um, we get the righteousness of God. The right, we're in Christ constantly in Colossians. And we're in Christ, in Christ, Philippians, all the way through, we're in Christ. Uh, the, the picture of the prodigal son, you get the robe of the father so that you're wearing the righteousness of Christ so that when God looks at you, he sees Jesus Christ. And one writer points this out. He says, we get treated by God like Christ. He looks at us as if we are Christ. And, and he says, let us, almost like, like, let us pretend that you are Christ in a sense, because that's what I see when I look at you, when you get the righteousness of Christ on you. And then the writer says this, that seems strange, but it's very important because this is how the higher thing raises the lower. A mother teaches her baby to talk by talking to it as it understood, as if it understood long before it really does. We treat our dogs like they're human and they become, that's why we end up saying they're almost human. Why does that dog act almost, my dog, man, she, she acts almost human because she's treated that way by my kids. We treat someone a certain way and they become and they grow up into that thing. And God looks at us in Christ. The Son of God became a man so that men might become sons of God. He looks at us as if we were in Christ because that's the only way we ever start to look like Christ. He says, let's pretend. And by treating you this way, you become like it. So Father, I pray that that's the practical reality of our life, that the cross isn't just this concept, but we see it, yes, as the means to be forgiven. Yes, as the means of going to heaven when we die. Yes, as the means of being justified by faith. Yes, as the means of not going to hell. All of these beautiful things. But, but also, as this story says, as the means by which we ever get sanctified, purified, by the, the means by which we ever get happy, the means by which we ever get fulfilled in this life. The cross isn't something on the side of that. It is the only way there. So let us use it the way you have given it to us. Let our actual lives change in light of it. And then let those lives reflect out and draw men, women, kids, elderly people to know you because of the joy that is reflected in that. Do that transformative work. Change our lives from the water that they were to the beautiful, colorful, infused with meaning lives that you dream up for each of us. Do that work among us and let people actually come to know you because of it. In Jesus' great name we pray.
again for joining us today. It's just so exciting to see what God is doing through Village Church and even in the greater Toronto area. Um, can you just help us know as viewers, if we're in that area, can you help us know what to do next? Well, the easiest way to connect with us in the greater Toronto area or another city in Ontario is to go to thisisvillagechurch.com forward slash Toronto and sign up for our email updates and we'll send you bi-weekly updates on what's happening, community groups that are launching, local mission initiatives, and so much more. It is so exciting to be a part of this church and thank you for everyone who gives and your generosity to this church and even what is happening in greater Toronto area. If you want to give, you can support at thisisvillagechurch.com slash give or you could text Village Church to 77977. And with that, make sure you tell your friends and your family about February 28th, The Problem of Jesus series. We are so excited for it. Thank you again for joining us.